Um, and so Jill actually found the translator, and that was how this began. And it grew, and it grew. It grew to expand to other <laughs> rescuers in other parts of Europe. Um, it grew into, with Dr. Baird's help, it grew into research about what kind of people had become rescuers. It grew to Israel, it grew to Washington, it went to the Holocaust Center in Pittsburgh. Um, and finally, Jill and I met so many times about this project and tried to get some parameters built around it because otherwise it was just gonna go on forever. And so um, we managed to do that talking many times about how to organize it, what it would include, what would be left on the cutting room floor. And also she began working with Don Ma, who is the person who directed all the multimedia parts of this project. Um, and it was hard to stop the train, which is Jill. <laughs> she wants to keep going on and on. And I was like, you know, this is not yet your life's work. This is just a project for your MFA. Um, so here we are to learn what Jill has found and what she has produced. Um, it holds promise to fascinate all of you, I think. And I think we need to begin to hear it from Jill. Thank you so much. Oh, she you're just knocked out some, some of my slides, too. too. <laughs> it, they bear repeating. <laughs> oh, yay. There's a couple chats. I don't know if that's important. Sorry. There's a couple chats up there. Hello. turn on my mic. I've got all this fancy equipment around me. So, I mean, a big round of thanks for Professor Ma, Don Ma for setting up, for providing this room. He came in as he does um, at the 11th hour and offered up this amazing broadcast studio for me to, to hold this. So I really, really want to thank him. And we worked on Friday setting things up and testing things. And then again, uh, uh, just before this started, uh, testing things. And it's got lights and cameras and everything. So this is really wonderful. Um, one word, um, if you're watching on the YouTube live stream, I mistakenly said that you would be able to um, enter in some questions. Um, I, that I don't believe that is going to be working. So if you did want to do some sort of Q&A, you're going to have to, if you want to be interactive like that, you're going to have to hop onto Zoom. Um, but otherwise, um, like Professor Patterson said, I'll give my presentation. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a Q and A, um, and then go from there. Um, any questions before we get started? Enjoy your cookies. Great. Yeah. Sorry for those of you that are missing my cookies. I brought them in on my bike. You knew I would. I would do that. I had to do that one thing. Okay. Let's see. If I can even get started. Okay. Well, we took care of one slide already. <laughs> I wanted to say a big round of thanks for my committee that's helped me over the past year, year and a half. Um, Professor Maggie Patterson, who's been my primary advisor and uh, just really coming in and answering questions and talking me off the cliff a few times. And then Professor Don Ma, um, with the audio and visual, uh, video elements, he's just really changed how I've been able to improve my technical skills with that. And then Dr. Marie Baird was referred to me as I was starting that original paper with Professor Patterson. Uh, she's in the theology department and uh, coincidentally specializes in Jewish studies and the Holocaust and has a lot of experience with rescuers. And it was just an amazing connection. And she's been so incredibly helpful the past year, always answering my questions and really helping to support my enthusiasm in this. And I thank you guys very, very much. Again, as <laughs> Professor Patterson was saying, um, the origin of my project, like all things, it started in Italy. Um, she really gave a perfect background um, from where I started. Uh, I'm not going to say any more other than you have to read chapter one in my paper if you want to know more about where it came from. Uh, in the photo, that is uh, me in 2016 in uh, 
Toronto, Italy, and this is the man who really started this whole story. This is Ivo Faltoni, who was Gino Bartoli's bicycle mechanic um, back in the 1940s. And uh, he passed away in February of 2020, and he was a huge shepherd of the Bar Bartoli story once it started to be told about his rescuing of, of Jewish people during the Holocaust. And so I had a chance encounter with him. Um, that's all I'm going to say. You have to read, read my paper. Um, but like she said, I, I started, I wanted to get this story out of me and I uh, had the opportunity in her class and she allowed me to run with it and guide me and, and, and it evolved a lot <laughs> over the past 18 months, <laughs> an awful lot. And I know a lot of stu other students, you know, we always chat together, like, what are you doing? How are you doing this? You know, I don't know what to do. And I don't know if there is one answer. Mine literally started five years ago and I had this opportunity and it just found me. So, and it's just evolved so much. And so I guess, you know, if you have something that is your passion or you're interested in, just run with it. And cause I never, ever, ever saw this coming. <laughs> and then all of a sudden here we are. Uh, the purpose of my project um, I wanted to do a multimedia project, so writing and video and audio and uh, interactive visuals. Um, and I focused on it being a capstone project to introduce the bravery of Holocaust rescuers who risked their lives to save Jews from the Holocaust in World War II. And using, specifically using stories from five different rescuers from four different European countries, I wanted to examine the importance of remembering these Holocaust rescuer stories, who were the Holocaust rescuers, defining who they were, exploring who they were. Uh, one of the amazing things on my journey was that I had no idea there was, there were, there was actually been research done on Holocaust rescuers and on their personalities and characteristics about what made them be so different from all the bystanders in World War II who did absolutely nothing. So I will be talking about that. And then the new Holocaust education, um, where does everything that we've been learning for the past 80 years, how does that apply to um, students today? Uh, in May, I did my project proposal and all the deliverables that I, I planned on doing. Um, first one was a literary slash research paper <laughs> that keeps going and going. I was still adding things to it last night. Um, and so that will be a PDF. Um, Please don't print it, that's a lot of paper. Um, but there will be a PDF of, of the paper available. Um, because this is a multimedia project, I wanted to put together a website. So my paper is broken down into chapters and each chapter has um, its own webpage. And I'll go through this at the end and show you the website. And then embedded within each chapter to make it interactive is I have video clips of, of the particular rescuers that I highlight and some of the survivors archival testimonies to follow the narrative of the story that I'm telling. And then historic photos also to give context of what did it look like back then, what were they going through that really helps give a perspective of what it was like. And then because I'm a map person, I, I, uh, I was a map person for 20 years before I came here, um, I insisted on uh, making what are called story maps. Um, web pages of uh, interactive maps and photos and videos. So think about like the New York Times multimedia story, but with no budget, and that's what I did. <laughs> but uh, that was really important to me to be able to give a geographic context um, to what was happening uh, 80, 80 years ago. My methodology, I actually did try to have some sort of methodology to everything. Um, I have zero background in World War II or the Holocaust or Jewish studies. Um, so I dove into a lot of academic research papers in the Gumberg Library, you know, just searching for keywords and interest in, um, in book research from particular researchers or Holocaust survivor stories or rescuer stories. I spent a lot of time just doing a lot, a lot of reading. Um, one of the, the, like the primary place where I got a lot of my information was from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Their online um, website uh, and database is absolutely phenomenal. I don't know if Steven Spielberg paid for all of it. <laughs> He's invested a lot of money in the museum, and I, I kind of make a joke, but 
it is so well done and I'm a data person so I'm very particular <laughs> about being able to find information and it is so well done I just absolutely love it um, so I was able to research and do um, search for rescuer testimonies and survivor testimonies and I query down to what ones are done in English what ones are of decent quality video and audio quality because a lot of these were recorded in the 1980s or maybe early 1990s so you know it wasn't a production like we have here today and um, having a high quality video wasn't their purpose you know they were doing it for basically for research purposes but anyway so I really dove into that and spent a lot of time watching those videos and reading the transcripts and getting good information and then doing in-person interviews with uh, current subject matter experts um, as a lot of you can relate during the pandemic it's been very difficult to get together with people um, especially uh, I wanted to talk to a lot of high school teachers who teach about the Holocaust or um, what they're doing and they were very hard to get a hold of especially after dealing with last year over the summer they just literally checked out um, but I was able to reach out to a few of them um, and then uh, one a tiny tiny silver lining in the pandemic was all of the online events that were available, uh, recorded ones or live ones. Uh, I attended so many amazing online seminars about topics that I didn't know anything about, you know, whether they were broadcast from Jerusalem, from Yad Vashem in Israel, or in Washington, DC, or in California. I, <laughs> I learned so much amazing information. It was just absolutely fantastic. And then I did a lot of map customization um, again, to give that geographic context to what exactly Europe looked like in World War II for, for these rescuers and, and for the Holocaust. And here's just a screenshot of what the um, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website looks like and um, their kind of layout, which, again, I really, really appreciated them doing. So I'm going to try to distill World War II into about less than 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> which is not it's just pretty much impossible um, but the four so based on the research I did on the Holocaust Museum website and looking for testimonies I I knew I wanted to focus my research my paper on Gino Bartoli in Italy but I wanted to find some others to give kind of a, some different perspectives and so I talked to Dr. Baird in one of the countries we really wanted agreed that I should focus on is Poland um, occupied Poland I should say um, it was um, it, it was the center of the Holocaust it was the center of the extermination um, and it was on purposely designed to be like that um, unfortunately um, it was occupied by Nazi Germany in 1939 and pretty much kicked off World War II Germany came in from the West Russia came in from the East and they had absolutely they were the, the Polish army had absolutely no no choice um, so they were they were taken over Germans were brought in native Germans were brought in the city's names were changed street names were changed the uh, Polish language you weren't allowed to speak Polish uh, the Jews were automatically taken to concentration camps native uh, Polish people were also taken to camps for labor so they were just completely taken over um, and uh, it was a very, very, it, from day one, um, they were very, very bad off. Um, let's see. The second country that I chose was Denmark. And again, this is based on some of the testimonies I was able to get a hold of. Um, see, Dem well, actually, I'll go into a little more detail in a second. I'll just show you quickly which countries I, I chose. Um, and then the Netherlands, um, focusing on Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And then again, Italy. Um, Italy uh, and right here I'm showing a screenshot of what Europe looked like in April of 1944 to kind of give you a breadth of exactly what all of the Axis countries and occupied countries looked like versus you know the very small patches of where the Allies were and how uh, quite dismal it was uh, for people in Europe uh, during 1944 before um, Germany admitted defeat and the Allies came in so Poland, I started to talk about Poland and how it was the center of, of extermination. Um, so one of the rescuers that I talk about is Jan Karski. And he was known as uh, the diplomatic spy. 
he was in the Polish army before the war. He was trained as a diplomat, so he already had those ties. And when Poland became occupied, he worked with the Polish underground um, who was working to save Jews. And he, the, the Polish government went into exile in France and then, and then up into London. And he would sneak into concentration camps. Well, he would be snuck in by uh, the Polish underground um, he would witness what is going on. He would witness the atrocities of what was happening to Jews. And he was known for having a, a photographic memory. So he would report, he would use false identification. He would take trains all the way th you know, through occupied areas up into London. He would literally report to Churchill and the government, the allied leaders, and he would tell them what he is seeing. He met with uh, President Roosevelt and um, the American government, and he told them what he was seeing and that we have to do something to save the Jewish people, but he tried over and over again, and it fell on, unfortunately, deaf ears. They were very sympathetic, but their priority was for militaristic domination and crushing of Germany, and it wasn't to save these people. You can feel free to have a seat. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it's up above. So the second rescuer, I, fin I, I focus on two rescuers uh, from Poland. Jan Karski, because he was so unique as being a diplomatic spy. But then Irene Optyk was a rescuer. She was on her own. She was a Catholic Polish person who was captured by the Russians and then captured by the Nazis and forced to work at their headquarters. Uh, she, she worked as a, lawn, a laundry worker manager and then in the kitchen and there was a ghetto and a labor camp next to the Nazi headquarters in occupied Poland, and they would work for her. And whenever the ghettos were being raided and they were being deported, she would hide them inside the Nazi headquarters. <laughs> uh, she would hide them on, in a closet under blankets. She would hide them in the ductwork. She would hide them in a neighboring building. She literally hid them under the nose, noses of the Nazis that she was working for. And her bravery was just amazing. And I, I, we'll, we'll listen to some of her testimony in a bit. Um, but that's just one example of the sacrifices people made. Going up to Denmark, uh, Denmark was occupied in 1940, like many countries were, but Germany considered them their Aryan brothers. So they, uh, one, one interesting thing about World War II is that to, the occupation of Germany, um, they either went in as a military government takeover or a civilian government takeover. If it was a mili German military government takeover, um, it was, a cons can't say it was easier, but it was a little more hands off as far as the occupation went. Um, they brought in German military personnel who were not Gestapo, they were not Nazis. Um, so they had a little, a little more leniency in, in how they were occupying a country. So that was Denmark. Um, Denmark Arts also had a very low population of Jews. They had less than 8,000 people. So during the time that they were occupying in Denmark, it was a little hands off. Um, Jews were, the racial laws were not enforced, um, but there was still a lot of resistance. The, Ger the Denmarks did not want to be occupied. They'd never liked the Germans. Um, and so they did have resistance um, going on. They had organized underground. And then in 1943, when the Germans decided we're done with you, we want to fully occupy you and take over, uh, they deported, they tried to deport all of the Jews, but the underground was ready for that because they had a spy. And they managed to literally take on fishing boats in the matter of about less than a month, about three weeks, over to Sweden, just across the one strait to neutral Sweden. And they saved 8,000 8, Jews and, and other vulnerable people. And uh, 120 Jewish people died in concentration camps before they could help them. But Knud Daibi, the rescuer I focus on, he was one of the linchpins in uh, the operation to make that happen. And then in the Netherlands, so the Netherlands was occupied by Germany in a civilian government capacity. Unlike Denmark, uh, the Nazis came in, the Gestapo came in um, and completely took over the government. Uh, they had uh, uh, no control at all. The, the Dutch people had no control at all. Um, and they automatically started deporting Jews right away in 1940. There were 140,000 Jews in the Netherlands. Half of them lived in, in Amsterdam. So Amsterdam was a very, very small, densely populated area. The houses were right up against each other. So to try to imagine how to hide 70,000 70, people 
is just is just out, uh, outstanding. And so Tina Strobos was a, a university student at the time, and, and um, her network was part of the, this university. And all these students got together, and they and they fought, and they saved Jewish people. They hid them. They got them. They got them passports. They saved children. They, they children. They hid them in their house. She was part of uh, the Underground Railroad that would try to take people to Spain. So she was just a remarkable. And this is a photo of her on the left. And then her mother was also involved. She's standing there on the right. And then finally, Gino Bartoli, uh, Professor Patterson explained a lot of this at the beginning. Um, but Italy's situation during the war, um, you had Mussolini, who was the dictator, the fascist dictator back in the 30s. And interestingly enough, he thought that the Italian people were the superior <laughs> race. And I kind of have to laugh about that because you get a lot of that even when you go over there now. Um, but Mussolini was, was in charge uh, of Italy. The racial laws of 1938 were not enforced. It's interesting. Um, the, the, the strange, comparing all these different countries and, and how they related to the racial laws, it, it's, they're all completely different. It's really interesting. Mussolini was actually very hands off with the Jews. They had open borders, so Jewish people from other countries fled to Italy for refuge. So they had organizations that were taking in these Jewish refugees into Italy, not deporting them. They were putting them into what were called internment camps. So they were almost like small villages. Um, where, you know, it was a camp, and they had barracks, and it was organized, and they were under guard and protection. Um, but they had synagogues. They had marriages. They had little schools. So they were actually... Um, you know, they were fed. They were not well off, but far better well off than in other areas of Europe. And it wasn't until 1943 <coughs> when the Allies started to um, come in, into the boot of Italy, as you can see there, um, that the Nazis again said, okay, we're done with this. We're taking over Italy. Um, they occupied Rome. They occupied all the major northern cities, and they started deporting Jews out of Italy to, um, to occupied Poland. And that's when um, the networks of rescuers really went into action. The underground networks really went into action. And Gino Bartoli was part of uh, a religious organization called the Assisi Network. And it was headed by his friend who was the Archbishop of Florence who headed this. <laughs> and so between the Archbishop of Florence and Assisi, the small hill town south of Florence, um, they hid hundreds and hundreds of Jewish people in monasteries and convents. And like Professor Patterson said, he, um, he was given a pass to actually ride his bicycle and train during this time because he was such a notable accomplished cyclist. Um, but part of his role was to s literally roll up um, fake ID identification documents and hide them inside of his bicycle and take them from er to area to area for Jews to flee occupied, occupied uh, Italy. And then he also uh, had friends who were Jewish who lived in Florence, and he also hid them in the basement of one of his apartments in Florence. And so they say that he saved uh, over 800 people with the work that he did. And he never talked about it in his life, ever. And I go into that in my paper, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so who were these remarkable people? Who were these rescuers? Um, the one researcher I highlight, her name is Eva Fogelman. In her book, she says that they were sneaks, thieves, smugglers, hijackers, blackmailers, and killers, a womanizer, a manipulator, a seasoned briber, habitual liar, shameless forger, anti-Semite, tramp, and a murderer. So that's a way of telling you that they were everyday people. They were not special people who were just born to, to be a rescuer and to be altruistic. They came from all walks of life. In addition to this uh, you know, variety of, of, of person, um, they could be doctors, they could be peasants, they could be merchants, they could be uh, a champion cyclist. It didn't matter. They came from all walks of life. Let's see, can we hide that? Sorry, I guess that's just gonna be in the way. Whoops. Okay, continuing on who were Holocaust rescuers, um, after the war, after World War II, nobody wanted to talk about it. They said, we're done, we're moving on. Um, 
you know, we conquered Germany, that's all that matters. Um, nobody talked about it for a solid 15 years. They had the Nuremberg trials, they got that out of the way, they prosecuted a lot of Nazis, um, but then everybody forgot about it. And nobody ever talked to Holocaust survivors or let them, they didn't want to talk and nobody wanted to know, they wanted to forget. But in the 1960s, and I go in a lot of depth in my paper about this, there was a real uh, revitalization of wanting to know not only what happened, but why, and trying to figure this out and holding that generation accountable, especially in Germany. And so in the 60s, there was this renewed sense that we need to know what these, who, what these stories are. We need to know who these people are who are still alive. And so Yad Vashem, which is in Israel, it, it's the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, and it was designated by its government um, to collect testimonies of survivors and rescuers, so they really had um, more uh, uh, incentive to start collecting these stories and making them matter for, for posterity, for history. Um, and one of the main reasons that they wanted to also collect stories of rescuers was to refute the idea that there was this moral paralysis during the war that nobody did anything. Um, they wanted to acknowledge these extraordinary efforts that the rescuers actually did in saving people and to recognize them. Uh, they, so they're, they're uh, researchers and they're historians. They defined exactly what is altruism and they defined it as helping another person voluntarily at considerable cost and without the expectation of external reward. And people, they do, whenever that someone is nominated to be a rescuer, it, it, it takes a few years and the research, uh, when they're finally designated um, as meeting the criteria that I will show you, they are designated as righteous Gentiles, and those are considered non-Jewish people who were also living through the war, who summoned their moral courage to take great risks, and who sacrificed their own safety to save Jews. And so, again, these researchers, um, not just anybody can become a righteous Gentile, they actually have some pretty strict criteria. Uh, one of the things that they look for and they research is uh, whether the person actually risked their life to save Jews from deportation and death. They wanted to make sure that this rescue effort was rooted in a huma humanitarian concern, not money, because some rescuers, actually quite a number, actually expected payment. They said, well, we'll hide you, but you have to pay us X amount of money or your jewelry or uh, you know, a one-time payment, or they would ask payments for every month or they would increase it and if a Jewish family couldn't pay them they kicked them out so there's there's definite documentation of that so that was not allowed and then they could not harm the Jewish people while they were under their care it was you know they were they were safe from any kind of harm there has to be actual testimony or documentation from a survivor and as you can imagine that's getting harder and harder to do uh, as the years go by and part of the acts of rescue includes sheltering people, hiding them, like hiding them in the floorboards, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in cabinets, uh, hiding in, in attics, uh, helping them to obtain new identities with uh, passports or national, um, national identity cards, or transporting them to safe, safe havens. Those are just a few of the examples. And so once they are designated as a righteous Gentile, they're also designated, brought into the Righteous Among the Nations ceremony. And so this ceremony is held at the Yad Vashem campus in Jerusalem. And um, you can see there on the left, that's uh, Irene Opdake. Uh, they, as a part of the ceremony, is that they plant a tree in the garden, to, which you know, represents going on for generations and generations. The, the people that they saved will still be going on for generations and that the Nazis, the Hitler, could not keep them from doing that. On the right, that's Knud Daibi with his plaque with his name, also at the Yad Vashem campus. And then in the center, that's a medallion that they are also given. And the inscription says, whoever saves a single soul, it is as if he saved the whole world. And um, as of January 2021, 27,921 people have been designated as righteous among the nations. And we're gonna watch a, a short video um, where Jan Karski talks about this. In Jerusalem, you can approximately 5,803 streams of diplomas. 
this is a rapture. The small rapture that must be met, 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 always. So, even if they are dead, that makes you before the Jewish post-war generation, again, not to lose faith in for the non-Jewish post-war generation to make them realize first who were lack of tolerance, the anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, who were do they need to? Yesterday, Jews, Tomorrow, perhaps Catholics, or whites, or yellows, or blacks. And secondly, what uh, uh, obedience to our Lord commandment, love your neighbor, can do. Mm -hmm. It can save people, even in such circumstances as the Second World War. So, basically, what Jan Karski is um, saying, you know, one of the many things that he says, uh, we'll never know how many people were actually rescuers and who, who could have been designated as a righteous among the nations. Um, you know, they documented barely 28,000 people, but during the war, they were killed or they died or right after the war, uh, war they died or they didn't want to be recognized. I mean, they, some of the researchers estimate it could be as high as 500,000 people helped, but we'll never know. But the ones that they have verified, telling their stories is just incredible and needs to continue. So the science of Holocaust rescuer altruism, again, I just stumbled on this, you know, as I was researching about Holocaust rescuers, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, as these testimonies started to be revealed in the 60s or so, a lot of sociologists and psychologists thought, well, we want to know more about them, what made them risk their lives to do what they did. So a lot of research began in the late 1970s. Uh, these sociologists wanted, to, they, their goal was, well, maybe we can discover what their traits are, what their commonality is, and maybe we can cultivate it. Maybe it can be nurtured in our society today. Um, and it's interesting to point out the results that they did find. There's no one size fits all. Uh, one rescuer didn't have uh, all of the traits, or they might have just had one trait, or they might have had none of the traits, but it, it's science, and so, so uh, these are the results that they had. And it's important to know that just because one person did maybe uh, grow up with a certain uh, characteristic or trait, that doesn't mean automatically mean that they were able to rescue or that they could because of the circumstances of, well, what country were they in? Were they, how were they occupied? What was the danger level? Or did they have children? Having little children in your house they, it's very difficult for them to keep secrets. So, you know, did they have enough money to buy food for the people that they were sheltering? So there's all sorts of different variables. The first, res uh, first researcher that I highlight, it's a, a husband-wife team, Sam and Pearl Oliner. And I'm sorry to say, we actually just lost Sam Oliner a few weeks ago, um, and his wife, Pearl, passed away earlier in 2021. Um, Actually, four people that I talk about in my paper have passed away <laughs> in the past two years. And the original name of my paper was One Last Voice. And so we, we now have four, four less voices. Um, Sam Oliner survived the Holocaust. He was a young Jewish boy. That's a picture of him there. Um, during the Holocaust, he was hidden uh, by a rescuer, uh, hid on their farm. He, his story is just incredible what he dealt with. Um, eventually he got to the US, he uh, became a researcher and he met his wife Pearl and they were sociologists and they wanted to investigate what makes, made these rescuers so altruistic. And so they studied 800 rescuers and bystanders to get different uh, perspectives of you know, you know, quantitative and qualitative research studies. And some of the key traits that they found um, was a propensity for, for having really high values, for having values of equity, of fairness, of empathy and justice. Um, basically that innocent people should not be persecuted and that we're all equal. Seems really simple, doesn't it? Um, parental influence, this is an incredibly common theme. Um, that you had role models that were caring and that they instilled that there's 
no difference between any of us, um, whether it was a parental influence or another adult role model. And interestingly, um, the way that uh, children as they were growing, how they were disciplined makes a really big difference too. Uh, the people who were rescuers, they tended to grow up in families where if they made a mistake, there was discussion and explanation. There wasn't punishment. So the parents talked through, okay, what did your actions do to harm somebody else? So there was a lot of that. And they did the, um, the people who were more bystanders grew up in abusive homes. And so we're going to listen to what Irene Updike has to say about growing up. My father built a factory, ceramic factory. And he did have a many people understudy. And uh, there were Polish and Russian and Jewish and Christian and Germans and many of the, some of the people were married. So we did have a united nation with children and we played together. There was not any um, hate between us. We just tried to find the nicest way to have a pleasure in playing, that's all. So you, your parents always were accepting of other kinds of people? Yes. We were wonderful. There was never, I did not know the word antisemitism. I learned that during the war and after the war. There was not any difference in the place I live. If that's true, that there was not any, this is a, a, a Jew or that this is a, a Don Paul or that this is a, a, anybody, you know. I didn't hear that, that uh, my father or mother speaking about that. But often they just said, you have to uh, be good and play together. And they try to put uh, lots of love in us, for us, for, for ourselves, and also for other people. Okay. And then um, one of the other main um, characteristics that the Alliners found was a predisposition to action. None of the uh, Jewish people or I'm sorry, none of the rescuers went out and said, oh, I want to find a Jewish person to save. It was the opposite. Jewish people came to them and said, I need help. And then that triggered something within the rescuer that said, I'm going to do something. I, don't, I might not have a plan, but I'm going to take action to help you. So that was a very, very common theme uh, within the rescuers. And if, even if, whether they were by themselves or whether they were part of a community, being part of a community, um, that had an expectation that you do take action to help people. That was another significant finding of that. The second rescue or researcher that I looked at was Eva Fogelman. And um, some of you are familiar with the uh, researcher Stanley Milgram from the late 70s. So Stanley Milgram uh, did experiments, psychological experiments about authoritarian figures and whether people uh, would stand up to an authoritarian figure if they were inflicting pain, like literal pain in his experiments on people. Um, well, Eva Fogelman actually studied with Stanley Milgram, but she was interested in the opposite. She said, well, what's, what makes people actually stand up to that authoritarian figure? That's who I want to study. And that led her to learning about the Holocaust rescuers, and she was fascinated with, well, what made them actually stand up to everything that was going on around them? And so she was a psychologist, and so she looked at the research from a psychological um, angle. And one of the defining characteristics that she d discovered is what she coined the term rescuer self. And this is, it was a psychological transformation that the rescuers underwent to rebalance the stress of this new reality of living, of saving people, of having to lie, of having to have a new identity of having um, violence and uh, potential violence inflicted upon them at any time, um, knowing that if they were caught, they would be killed. Um, and they, they forged this identity based on strong moral values that it was a foundation of how they were brought up, and it rationalized their efforts to create this new identity. Their identity was much more flexible than the bystanders. The bystanders were very rigid and said, I can't do that, I have to follow my own path I can't change the way I do things. So there was a big difference between um, the identity between how rescuers saw themselves and bystanders saw themselves. And so we're going to watch a brief video about how Tina Strobos discusses 
her rescue herself. Yes, we were terrified all the time. But, you know, you can suppress that fear if you know that it's important what you're doing. I also distributed uh, underground newspapers. I thought it was important enough to risk your life for. I wasn't such a daredevil that I carried a gun or did made bombs. I was 100% um, into making passports, underground papers, and hiding people, mostly hiding people, and taking care. And I would visit them once a month. I would be the only contact for them with their family or with, well, their old world. It was very important. What kind of people? were the rescuers that you knew about? Well, I suppose that we had a strong sense of justice and um, a strong sense of that the Nazis shouldn't win and that we should do everything to make them thwart their, their efforts. And that the worst thing they did was really to the Jews. They were the m most victimized and that uh, they had very few choices. And so we should help them, and we did. And most of the people I know did help. And most people I know were in the underground, and most of the underground people that I know were involved in this rescue work, I would say. So were all of you fearless? No. You could be scared to death and do what you have to do. Like I said, you know, even if it's the last thing I do, I have to do that. I have to, because else I can't respect myself. Thank you. She gets me every time. <laughs> okay, um, so some other traits that Eva Fogelman uh, found in her research. Common thing, uh, core values in early childhood. She also found that with the people that she studied, um, rescuers came from very nurturing, loving homes. And again, they had altruistic role models, either in the parents or another adult role model. Learning to think independently. Uh, rescuers were good at problem solving. Again, when, when a predisposition to action came, they were out to solve a problem. They knew um, what their consequences of actions would be on other people. They understood a balance of power, um, and that made them think that, you know, I want to help somebody who's being bullied or who's being persecuted. They knew what the consequences of that were. They didn't go with the flow with what the bystanders did. They were able to think about saving somebody first beyond themselves. And then a lot of different moral motivations she found, ideological motivations, meaning you know, justice for all people, everyone's created equal, deep religious moral values that God created everyone equal, and it's our duty here on earth to take care of other people, belonging to a network, groups of people together who opposed the Nazi agenda, and they made acts of resistance together, Judeophiles who already had existing friendships with Jewish people um, before the war, and then concerned professionals such as doctors or social workers who had those resources already um, at the ready access in order to be able to help. And then the final researcher um, that, I, uh, that I highlighted is Nahakma Tech, and she was also a survivor, a Jewish survivor from Poland who was hidden. Um, her family, uh, I, I talked about how some rescuer, well, so-called rescuers asked for payment, and her family had to pay uh, a, um, a Polish family to keep them, to hide them, and they did survive the war. And so she came back to Poland um, to do her research, and she wanted to focus just on Polish people um, because that was the center of, the, of the, all, most of the atrocities. Um, she wanted to see, okay, what made them want to save people when Nazis and, and, and collaborators were literally just shooting people on the street. And so her uh, characteristics she found 
individuality was a big trait, whether the person, the rescuer, was physically removed from a community um, so that they weren't influenced by what everybody was doing in that town, um, or they were emotionally distant, um, they weren't controlled by others, again, getting back to the whole Stanley Milgram paradigm, and then that feeds into being highly independent, very strong moral convictions, they were not easily swayed by other people, they had those strong moral convictions that they were going to stick to, and they stood up to those in need and who were being persecuted. They came from gener generations of family members who had a history of altruism, lifelong pattern of helping people. So over and over from their parents, grandparents, great grandparents, they knew that that was what you did, how you treated other people. And then modesty for acts of rescue. Over and over and over again, you hear them say it was just the right thing to do. And, and they don't say, you know, it was just what you did. Um, a lot of them said, well, an act of rescue was just part of the war. We're probably going to die, so I want to die helping somebody. That's what my moral convictions tell me to do. And then spontaneity. Again, like I said, um, none of these rescues were planned. Somebody came to them for help, and then they, they figured out a way to make it happen. And then universalism, the fact that they think that there's no difference between everybody, we're all the same. And briefly watch Knud Dybe talk about his experience in Denmark. You know, I, I really did not know a lot of the Jewish people I took care of. And I didn't know a lot of the saboteurs I sent over to Sweden. Um, I found that it would, you know, first of all, you wouldn't have any photographs, you wouldn't have any written material, and you did not want to know more than absolutely necessary. The only thing that was of any value was to save these people and get them off. It doesn't, it didn't matter who they were, but they were, uh, we didn't want to see them in concentration camp. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times that you didn't think that there was much anti-Semitism in Denmark as a whole, but were you aware of who was a Jew and who wasn't a Jew? Did you ever think about it? I never thought about it. We weren't even aware of it. I, I only remember now, many, many years after, I remember that we even had in my hometown, there was a, a synagogue and there were several Jews and they had their own cemetery next to one of our parks. And instead of anti-Semitism, I found them interesting because uh, we are a very homogeneous society. And I think they were very interesting, very intelligent and, and I liked them. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I, I, I didn't know what anti-Semitism was. And my parents neither. I think one of my uncles married a, a Danish Jew, Nathanson, in my hometown. But she was just as well, uh, accepted as well as anybody else. Okay, and so... Uh, the last section that I talk about is about the new Holocaust education. Um, things have changed dramatically in how the Holocaust is taught compared to how it was even when I was in high school. Um, and and it's, I think it's a really amazing positive direction. Um, and this is one of the things I sat down on a lot of online seminars to learn about. Um, and one of the phrases that keeps coming back over and over is that trauma doesn't teach. And that resonates with me so much, personally. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I was never, I never wanted to learn about the Holocaust because it was all about death. And um, it wasn't until I learned Gino Bartoli's story that I thought, wow, and it really got me, literally, I'm standing here talking about it. Um, but trauma doesn't teach, so that's where educators are going now. They want, um, it to be a more multidisciplinary approach. So it's not just a bunch of statistics in a history class that you teach for 45 minutes and then move on. They're bringing in not just history, but also global studies, civics, social studies, English, journalism, um, 
art, arts, graphic design, it's, it's incredible because it becomes, um, it's not just about learning about history, it's about learning about your community and how to treat other people. The teachers, the educators wanna teach students hope. It's not always about death, it's also about survivors and it's about rescuers. We wanna give people hope that even in the darkest circumstances, there's hope out there. There are stories of hope and resiliency. They wanna teach students empathy and tolerance, teach them to be better people, better in their community. They wanna teach them, yes, we wanna want you to be altruistic and look out for other people, and that takes courage, but it also has consequences. So that's an exercise that educators also go through is even if there's someone bullying someone down the hallway in front of the lockers, are you gonna step up and say something? Or if you do, are there any consequences? So they're walking them through these emotional uh, uh, skills, which is just, just really fascinating to watch and learn about. I was told that um, uh, the, the generation in school now, in high school now, they're incredibly open, more open about mental health. And, and so they wanna talk about mental health. They wanna hear about the struggles that people had during the war, uh, the generation that went through the war and even after, they didn't wanna talk about it. They wanna, didn't wanna talk about vulnerability or how much they struggled or how scared they were. Well, this generation does wanna know about it. They do wanna hear about it. They're inspired by hardship and resilience. So they want to hear the stories of, yeah, they, you know, about like Sam Oliner who almost died and was living, you know, eating grass in a field. And, but he was resilient and, and he lived and he survived. And then another interesting point, and this was also something that Dr. Baird pointed out to me, is that religion doesn't necessarily equal morals. Um, more and more young people are, are kind of pulling away from organized religion and identifying more as atheists. And um, that it doesn't mean that it, they're not moral people. And both Tina Strobos and Knud Dybe, well, Tina Strobos identifies strictly as an atheist and her, her grandparents were also, but they were incredible rescuers and saving people. That didn't mean they weren't moral. Knud Dybe jokes about how on any given Sunday, you wouldn't find 500 people in a, in a church on a Sunday. <laughs> So he didn't, he wasn't really interested in organized religion either, but they had morals and goodness. Um, you might be wondering where all this research went. Okay, does anybody even use it now? Um, and one of the real centers of uh, Holocaust education that teachers can be nominated to go to this really intense training is with the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. And they kind of distilled all of that research that I talked about into some common characteristics um, that rescuers had that they bring into the classroom that are a little more tangible to students. And those include being compassionate, uh, cooperation, courage, ingenuity, integrity, moral leadership, self-sacrifice, and social responsibility. And they also use rescuers of examples of showing all of these. Uh, some of, one of the incredible high school teachers that I did connect with and who was so incredibly helpful to me is Nick Haberman from Shaler, Shaler High School. Um, he won the 2018 Holocaust Educator of the Year and so I connected with him to ask him a bunch of questions and he's incredibly enthusiastic. Um, I love that he says openly, he's like, I'm a white guy from Etna. <laughs> he's like, I'm not Jewish, I don't know any Jewish people, my family doesn't know Jewish people, but he inherited the Holocaust program at the high school when he started there. And so he got to also take what they had, but build it up into what he wanted it to be. And he, had, he went to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, they got him a survivor, Jack Sitzmeitzer, to, Sitzamer, to come in and speak to his kids and it changed his life. And so he's built this incredible, multidisciplinary, holistic educational program that has just really knocked the socks off of a lot of um, kids and really influenced them. He wants this kind of education to be the equivalent of STEM for the humanities, which I think is just fantastic. He doesn't wanna take away STEM, but to build on it. What made STEM so successful and how can we do the same for humanities? Uh, with his award from 2018, he went and he built a program called LIGHT which is leadership through innovation and genocide and human rights teaching. Um, it teaches students leadership, it teaches them community skills. Um, they, 
it teaches them the human experience about immigration and tolerance and accepting other people and knowing where we came from and where we want to go. And so they take field trips to different cultural sites around the city. Here's a picture of the Maxo, um, Maxo Planco uh, murals, uh, learning about uh, the immigrant experience through those. Um, and another amazing thing is it's all fully funded. He's really done boots to the ground work to bring a really enhanced education experience to his students and other students uh, in the Pittsburgh, uh, Western Pennsylvania area. And then I couldn't not have this presentation without talking about the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, um, an absolute incredible resource that we have in this city. Um, and for an educational part, I wanted to talk briefly about their Hutzpah comic book series. And um, this is one of the pillars of, of their educational um, activities. Um, their their uh, coordinator, Marcel Walker, does a phenomenal job um, presenting the materials on this comic book. And something I didn't realize, I was never a comic book person before, um, but comic books and superheroes were built on that superheroes came from traumatic experiences. And he uses the example of Superman. Superman's planet was about to blow up and be destroyed. And what did his parents do? They sacrificed them, their lives and put him in a spaceship to Earth, and he was left all alone. I mean, what does that sound like, right? And so Superman came from a very traumatic experience, and it's through these stories of Superman and other superheroes that the readers, usually young adults or children, learn about empathy. And I just had this light bulb moment. I said, that's just brilliant. <laughs> I mean, what a tie-in. And so um, back in 2014, they started this series because Holocaust survivors are also superheroes. And so they wanted to tell the stories of these Holocaust survivors as superheroes and get the reader involved in their story of what their life was like before uh, the Holocaust, what happened to them, were they in, in camps. And the artists are able to visually draw everything because there's no pictures of what happened. So they're able to draw uh, the survivor's experience. Artists um, can come in, they can come into the classroom. The students get a real experience, direct experience learning about uh, a survivor uh, experience that way. And that little picture there is of Fritz Ottenheimer, who uh, was, is from Pittsburgh, he passed away. He was a Holocaust survivor and he was featured in issue number one. And, and he says, when you're acting as a Superman, you're teaching your children to be supermen, which is really, really great. Phew. Okay, so we're just gonna do a brief tour of the website that I put together for all of this. And um, so as I said, the, uh, the paper is broken down into different chapters. And so my website here, um, you scroll down and it introduces each of the chapters and then you can go into each of the chapters. And I have the text uh, from the paper but then I have it kind of put together in you know, more of a interactive multimedia uh, kind of fashion with pull out, pulled out quotes and then photos. And then, um, you know, like I was doing in my presentation here, having clips of, of, um, of the survivors to having their testimony tell the story as I'm, as I'm going through it as well. And so, you know, any particular topic that I'm talking about, I have a survivor or a rescuer testimony clip to go along with that. And they're not long, like the ones we just watched, they're like uh, 90 seconds, two minutes max. So short attention span, they're really good for that. And, you know, and they make their points pretty quickly, pretty well, which is really good for the, for the reader. And so that's what I have. So I like kind of this idea to put this all together. Um, so usable fashion. And then last thing I'll show is, are my maps because I have to show you maps. Um, so this is the kind of multimedia interactive map I was telling you about. Um, so here, this is kind of a condensed way to uh, learn about the story. Like this one is about the Netherlands and Tina Strobos. And so you scroll down and you get you know, some of the text about the story and photos. And so as you're scrolling down the map, will change or there will be a video you can watch, you know, in, in some text discussion about what's going on in background of the German occupation. And uh, so this, this is really, this is something I've always wanted to do. So I did this for 
Poland, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Italy. And it mimics what's in my paper as well. You know, and I put together some additional little videos to give people an idea of what it was like for the Jews being deported from Westerbork. Um, I love this photo of people from the Dutch underground. Look how young they were. They were university students, I mean, or younger. I mean, they were just so brave. They were amazing. You know, and bring in some satellite imagery. Um, I made, let me see, the last little thing I'll show is I made this video of, um, oops, it'll go, about using Google Earth Studio it has a lot of 3D imagery. And so I wanted to show what um, the density of, Ash of Amsterdam looked like. So imagine trying to hide 75,000 people. I mean, look how close these houses are. And Anne, Anne Frank's house is right there. Um, but uh, Tina Strobos talks about how there would be Nazis on the roofs of houses just shooting people in the street. So to kind of help give an idea of like what it was like to live during that time and trying to hide people and, you know, running from rooftop to rooftop to try to escape, but then not knowing if there was going to be barbed wire there, you're going to be shot. So, so there's that. I did that. And uh, so that was one of the map stories I did. Um, <laughs> and future research, I mean, I mean, this, this was, you know, like, I think, I mean, this just kept going and going. It can still keep on going. Um, the stories I've learned, I mean, this all needs to be on Netflix. It's like, <laughs> it needs to be mainstream. All the work that these educators are doing, it needs to be mainstream. I mean, I love me some Great British Baking Show and Lost in Space, but these, this would make really good fodder for Netflix. Um, having a survey of what Holocaust educators are teaching now and how it can be used uh, in other school districts around the country. Uh, that's one of the things I get to in my paper I didn't talk about here is uh, standardization of it. It's just not there at all. Um, Nick Haberman was saying he would love to have a survey like showing 10 years like how has empathy or altruism changed in my students or any of the students? Um, so there's so much potential in all of this. Um, and then conclusion, um, it was amazing experience to revisit all these stories and daylight them. Um, something I never saw myself doing. Um, Nick knows about my project, the Holocaust Center knows about my project and so he's gonna show this to his students. Uh, he said something really interesting when I was telling him about all of these testimonies I've been watching for a year, and he said, none of us have time to do that. <laughs> none of us can ever sit and watch six months of these testimonies and all of the trans transcriptions. He's like, that's going to be so incredibly helpful. So that was really nice to hear. Um, so you know, I'll pass this around to some of the teachers I talk to and see where it goes from there. So that's it. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, we need to clear the room. Uh, Do you need a breakout in? room? Pardon me? Do you need a breakout room? I need, to, I, I need a way to talk to Marie only. Oh, OK. Mute you, everyone but Marie? Yeah, and, and then turn their video off. You can do that, and then you can be here with Marie. Okay. Okay. Um, tell me what you need to do. Uh, no, why don't you just do it? Oh, I just mute. Like, I think everybody but Marie, if you just mute everybody but Marie. They'll be able to hear. They won't. No. Like, right now, the YouTube is still up. I need to shut oh, all that oh, off. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking I'm thinking wrong. Uh, we, if, we you put, if you put, um, if you put Jill and... Um, in a breakout room? In a breakout room. Right, but I can computer. put it so together. On the computer. Actually, computer. I, think, yes. I have YouTube. I have the I have the Zoom session in that room. Do you need to talk to somebody in the Zoom session? Yes, Marie, right. so, if so that's a yes or no. You have to talk to somebody in the Zoom session. We, I need to talk to you and and Marie. You and Marie. And Marie's in the Zoom session, right? That's all I'm trying to establish. But if you put yes. Marie in Yeah, so my suggestion is, is that Jill go somewhere. You could go in the control room. I could plug a microphone in. You could talk to the people. So there. they could just stay here. Um, let me see if I can run a camera, though. Um, I'm going to squeeze out short. I don't have a camera, so I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have all these cameras. I'm in the Zoom session. It's just unless you have 
Marie and like that computer or that computer out in a breakup session, then everybody else that's watching yeah. will also be able to hear you. Can you yeah. take somebody that's in a Zoom session and place them in a waiting room? Put yeah. them in a waiting room? No. In a waiting room. Yeah, I think you could have. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's the easiest way to do it. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be in touch. Oh. But I'm going to stop the YouTube stream so this stuff is on YouTube. Do you want to take some more cookies? Sure, I will. Okay. I have a little question. Do you want me to submit either of you? Me? Yeah. Oh, no, I've actually uh, seen this presentation like three times.